Okay, so I'll get started. All right. Um, so, these last two weeks saw the blow up in the Middle East with the U.S. pulling out of the Iran Treaty and Israel launching massive and deliberate provocations to inflame the region. We also saw an attempted blow up of North Korea summit by John Bolton. And I believe what he said about the Libyan model for North Korea was very deliberate. The design to blow it up. However, so far to a large degree, both attempts have uh, failed in their, um, in their intention. If anything, these events have accelerated the diplomatic and economic activity of those nations operating in the new paradigm and those nations contemplating joining the new paradigm and seeking to bring down the British Empire and replace it with a dialogue of civilizations in foreign policy and the belt and road in economic policy. Okay, so I'll start with the Middle East. What you see here, in this whole area here, is, is the crossroads between Asia, Africa, and Europe. Okay, this is the fulcrum of the interconnection of all these regions. It's the crossroads. And this is what has been um, under the Anglo-Dutch system, this is what has been, for centuries, been developed into a permanent war area. And um, now, the only solution is bringing the Belt and Road down through Iran and down to here, and then down to here, and then up to there. That's the only solution to the situation, because only then can you make these nations part of the global economy and also work to each other's benefit. And, and this goes back to conceptions that LaRouche was working with back when his original conception back in 1975 called the Oasis Plan. And that reality is not coming together. So let's start with the sanctions on Iran following the U.S. pullout of the treaty. Why would the U.S. pull out of the treaty? Well, there's many conjectures as to why the U.S. has pulled out of the treaty. You know, but the, the, the one I'm going to raise is the issue of control over Europe. The control over Europe. Now, what do I mean by that? Uh, Europe, the European, Eastern, Eastern uh, European population area is, is, is half a billion people, but they're highly developed and highly skilled. And the productive potential of Europe, along with, could be revived massively to develop uh, this area, not just along with China. And uh, the issue is how do you keep Europe boxed in so the nations of Europe can't, won't carry out, won't break out of this control and accelerate their economic and industrial uh, activities, with Germany being one of the leading nations in that, uh, to develop the rest of the world. Now, Europe, Europeans had a lot of business with Iran, especially Germany. And the sanctions kept them from, from having, uh, uh, benefiting from that business. Uh, Iran has the oil and other things that Europe required. And <coughs> um, so the idea of, of Pulling the U.S. out of the uh, treaty then opens the door for sanctions against Iran, but also secondary sanctions against European countries that do business with Iran. Okay, but it, it's 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 the it's the impl it's it's the implication of doing 
business with Iran that creates the basis for also doing business with Russia, for doing, you know, for doing business with China, which they're doing. It's, it's the whole idea of keeping the world divided. And to keep Europe, most of all, out of collaboration with the Belt and Road. And that's what the whole Ukrainian situation was all about. What was the problem? There was no problem. Uh, Ukraine was decided that it didn't really like the EU conditions. It preferred to orient the Ukrainian industrial capabilities and Ukrainian economy to the east. And that's when the coup occurred. And then that coup was set up, set up the basis for the sanctions on Russia, which then set up the basis for sanctioning Europe, for, for, for forcing Europe into the sanctions, for forcing Europe to not trade with Russia, not to cut off Russia. And they did. But that didn't, but that didn't stop Russia, and it didn't stop the whole process of the Belt and Road, because Russia worked with China, and the Belt and Road continued to grow, and Russia survived the sanctions. Largely because uh, they they adjusted, they they developed a lot of the industries that they were relying upon, and they worked with China. They opened, China opened. The, they began working with China. And so, so Europe is sitting there saying, "Well, we did this to bring down Russia, but it didn't bring down Russia. Russia is doing better than we are, or at least relatively. They're moving ahead." You know, we have all these business contracts we could have. We have all these products we could put into the Belt and Road. We have all these things. And we can't do anything under, this, under the existing system because of the United States, because of the bridge, because of the, the uh, um, you know, the, the European Union. So, so, and also this is the issue with the, with the, with the Nord Stream pipeline, which I believe goes up from, from the north of Russia down into Europe. To Germany. Huh? Germany. To Germany. Oh. This is another pipeline, and the U.S. is demanding that, that the Germans don't participate in that. So Germany is being told to commit economic suicide by the power that runs this global empire. And these are the things that have kept Europe in, uh, in the whole. Europe uh, in the United uh, in the European Union and, it, and on these circumstances is dead economically, and they won't break out and join. If they don't break out and join the Belt and Road, they're dead. Now this is understood in Europe among the business community. It is not really fully understood in Canada and the United States. They don't really get that aspect of. But Europe is closer to the reality of being on the other end of the Belt and Road. Destroying the Middle East is part of the same. Keep Europe out as, as well as shut down some of the key corridors for development. So, so the Belt and Road has to come through here, right? And then if, if any of these Middle Eastern countries, including Israel and Egypt, want to be part of the Belt and Road, well, they, they have to accept the existence of Iran because Iran is where it has to go through. You can't, that's the geography of it. So if you want to go to war with Iran, you're also, you're also going to war against your own potential future uh, economic development. So higher, higher, these countries by themselves can't, are, 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 are totally enmeshed in these wars and ideologies and religion, and all the problems that were created. But, it, but but the solution is going to come from outside, and it's going to be in the form of, of Europe breaking with uh, the empire, and then the U.S. breaking with the empire. Now, I'm going to that. And we're very close to that. Now, so <coughs> the issues in the Middle East will be resolved, have the potential of being resolved when Europe breaks with the empire of constraints. And then the US, then that'll follow, that'll open the door for the US as well. And Canada. In that context, the issue how the collapse of the financial system is handled will also determine bringing in all these nations into the Belt and Road. It is not a Middle East process, it is a global process. And this is understood by Putin and Xi. 
So now let's look at some of the recent developments in this respect. Uh, you have the unusual situation that is unprecedented of Angela Merkel uh, visiting Putin uh, twice in two weeks. I think the meeting was yesterday, the second one. And put, Putin put it onto Merkel on Germany's boycott of reconstruction aid to the Assad regime. In other words, he, he said, look, why are you boycotting reconstruction aid to to, uh, to the Assad regime. This is what would reverse the flow of refugees. And, and Merkel didn't object to that. She did make a complaint that the Assad government was uh, taking back abandoned property, because that abandoned property probably belonged to somebody. But you can't do anything in a lot of these areas unless you start developing, and you can't do it if you don't know who the owner is. So, but that's, a, that's but she did not. Uh, she did not take issue with it. Now, not only that, within two weeks, or less than two weeks, Merkel will be in China and will be meeting with Xi. And the threat of secondary sanctions on Germany for trading with Iran, the U.S. position on Nordstrom, and the threat to Germany's gas supply from Russia through Ukraine. Uh, in fact, Putin had to, had to uh, in the meeting, had to pledge that gas for Ukraine will continue after Nord Stream. Now, though it may be too early uh, to tell, a similar situation may be developing in Europe as in the Korean situation, where the parties of Japan, China, Russia, North Korea, South Korea have come together on future economic development, uh, which is why they were, Bolton was unable to derail the, the, the talks. I'll get into that later. Now, th this would be the next stage of the expansion of the Belt and Road. That's Europe. I mean, it is going into Europe, but to get Europe to, to break with it, with, with the system uh, that's holding them back. Up until now, Germany and Merkel have been adamantly opposed to the expansion of the Belt and Road into Europe. Adamantly opposed to uh, China working with these e poor Eastern European countries that want development. Now, in the increased hysterical reactions against China going on in the U.S. right now, you might perhaps see a clue that this is going on. Everything from China is out. Uh, you, you, have, you have attacks going on from China's about to invade Taiwan to supporting Latin America in preparing for another war in the Falcons and to overtake back the Falcons uh, to the greatest uh, indoctrination and detention in human history is being alleged uh, in this area here. Um, uh, uh, the Uyghurs. So they're, they're you know, so, mm -hmm. so they're making all these issues. And you have uh, in uh, in Nature Sustainability magazine, you have uh, a world wildlife uh, orientation that the Belt and Road is the uh, riskiest environmental project in human history. That that you know, it's the biggest threat to the planet is the Belt and Road. So, and this incredible now, in, in this we have an incredible round of diplomacy. You have Moody and Putin are meeting informally May 24th. You have the, the St. Petersburg Forum on May 24th and 28th. Now, unlike previous St. Petersburg Forums where, the, where Russia felt isolated, this one, uh, Abe will be the guest of honor, Shinto Abe, and Putin uh, and China, uh, Japan have a Russia Japanese Cultural Week, the same week. And Putin and Abe will be going to the Bolshoi. Abe will be one of the keynotes at the St. Petersburg Forum. And the panel will be who? It will be Putin, Abe, Macron, the president of France, and Lagarde, the head of the International Monetary Fund. They're going to be the panel. What? The IMF head and France are going to sit down with Abe and Putin and have a dialogue in, in the middle of the St. Petersburg Forum? 
What happened to all of the anti-Russian situation? <coughs> so this is very different. Now the Chinese are very active in all of this. Uh, Wang Yi, uh, the foreign minister, had visits to Portugal, Spain, and France. And uh, after after an all-out attempt to stop the Chinese from purchasing a major energy firm in Portugal, it is full steam ahead for Chinese investments in Portugal. So the, the, the government of Portugal says, screw that, we need development, we're going with China. And Spain is referencing China and Japan co-development in the Belt and Road as their model. Something similar is being discussed with the French foreign minister. So what, what the Chinese are going to in all these countries is just saying, look, you need to work with us in the, as co-partners in these development projects because that's the only way you're going to expand the world economy enough to give your people a better life. And then there's the beginning of the collaboration between India and China to guess what? After Modi and, 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 and G met last, uh, what did they agree to? Well, they agreed to do the following. India agreed to participate with China in building what? The Belt and Road, the rail system through Afghanistan and Iran to China and to Tajikistan uh, and Kyrgyzstan. So it goes, it goes like this. It goes through Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Afghanistan, and Iran, and then it goes east. And India is going to participate with China in building this. That's a huge development relative to having a border war over here. Okay? Then you have Li Keqiang, the Prime Minister of China, said, about addressing the trade imbalances of the United States. He's proposing that the United States partner with China in developing third party nations and get the U.S. exports going to develop other nations with China. And that's how the, the U.S. economy is going to grow and that's how they're going to deal with, their, with the fact that they're, ex, they're importing far more than they're exporting. This way they'll be exporting a lot more, but they'll be exporting to with not to, not to have a trade war with China where, 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 where China has to do this and that. Why? Because what, the Ch what, the, what Wall Street and the city of London want China to do is accommodate the U.S. by stopping their development. And that is, you know, uh, not exporting this but importing this. But China's saying, no, why don't we work together and develop these other nations and then Europe we can, we can both expand our, our exports. We can both expand and develop together. And this, I'm sure this message was delivered when the principal economist of China, uh, Liu He, met with uh, all of Trump's economic advisors, minus Navarro, who wrote the book Death by China. Uh, but this is the Chinese approach. It makes a lot of sense, right? Except for these, you know, dinosaur ment mentally, mentally, mental people in the U.S. Anyhow, so so the intervention that China is making into the U.S. is look, why don't you guys? And what Liu Hei is saying, and he's saying this because he he, he did a very extensive study comparing Franklin Delano Roosevelt's approach in 1933 and the approach in 2008. He said FDR policies addressed the root cause of the situation, whereas in 2008, nothing was addressed. They just papered it over and made it worse for the future. And so what is Liu Hei saying? He's saying that the United States needs structural changes. Now, what does he mean by that? He means Glass-Steagall, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's what he means by structural changes. The structural changes that he's talking about. So now in this context, let's look at Korea. Now, two, two things happened that were very significant. John Bolton made this comment. And then Trump had to dramatically uh, contradict 
uh, bolts uh, in this, okay? He had to dramatically contradict both. And, uh, and these are some of the things he said. Okay. Uh, he said that the Libya model is not what he has in mind for North Korea, although he did turn around and use it the opportunity to threaten Kim Jong-un again if he doesn't make a deal. Uh, but this is what he said. You can read it into, into it what you will. President Trump had to say to reporters is the following. Well, the Libya model isn't a model that we have at all when we're thinking of North Korea. In Libya, we decimated that country. That country was decimated. There is no deal to keep Gaddafi. There was no deal to keep Gaddafi. The Libya model was the Libya model that was mentioned was a much different deal. This would be with Kim uh, Young Un, something where he'd be there, he'd be in his country, he'd be running his country. His country would be very rich. His people are tremendously industrious. If you look at South Korea, this would really this would be really a South Korean model in terms of their industry, in terms of what they do. They're hardworking, incredible people. Now, so he 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 he, uh, he contradicted Bolton, and then the U.S. military had an emergency meeting and pulled back their B-52s and other weapons that they were involved in the ongoing exercises. So the so the U.S. back down. Since when does the U.S. back down like that? I've never heard of something like that. Now this is all happening in the context of threatening trade wars uh, between Japan and the United States, China and the United States, Canada and the United States, and which is still anti-Belt and Road. Trade wars are anti-Belt and Road. The, the Belt and Road is about expanding trade, not trade wars. And the U.S. is still on an anti-Belt and Road model, uh, negotiating with Japan and China bilateral relations uh, with other nations. So they're not, they haven't caught on to the model. Of course, if they do catch on to the Belt and Road model, then they have to make the structural changes in the United States. <coughs> While everything is being done to promote an anti-China military confrontation, now, the issues are not the South China Seas or human rights, the issue is trade. What they want to do is, for China, what China and Russia are saying, and what China, uh, what Putin said to the military meeting, and what she said to his military meeting, is that, is that the emphasis must be on the most rapid rate of advanced technologies, not only for the military, but for, this, for, the, for, the, for the economy in general. So that's where they're going. Uh, now we come to the sticky point. The biggest news in the United States I don't know if it's the same in Canada, is the, uh, is, is Gaga time, fairy tales, the opulent Cinderella of African American, African, Canadian American descent, marriage, royal marriage. The fact that the royal family uh, would allow one of their own to marry into the lesser races uh, goes a long way to symbolically announce the shift of the empire out of Great Britain into increasingly the offshore system. If, for instance, Merkel comes back from China two weeks from now after meeting with Xi with conceptions and uh, contracts on expanding German industry through participation with the Belt and Road, that would be up to now the greatest blow to the empire. Then looking at another major country in Europe, Italy, uh, the last elections was very different, uh, and the coalition discussion between the Liga Nord and Five Star uh, calls for an end to sanctions on Russia, the creation of a, of a, of a national bank for infrastructure, and separating the uh, capital bu budget from the Maastricht debt ceiling so, so that they could finance development without, without uh, 
going uh, without going against the the, the uh, austerity in in the agreement in, in the uh, European Union agreement. Now our our our, our people in in in, in uh, Italy are very are very close to both uh, elements of both parties, especially the League of North. Now the Financial Times of London calls this situation. This is by the way what the, what the uh, governing agreement is being worked out between these two. The Financial Times of London calls it the barbarians are in Rome. And the head of the League of North uh, said better a barbarian than a slave. So that's, there, there has some clarity in Italy about the situation. Uh, so if the empire is unable to provoke a war or a descent into a, a general war in whatever area you're talking about, whether North Korea, Ukraine, or the Middle East. Uh, the only other issue is the collapse of the financial system. Now, this is this is a this is a this is complicated. As the empire becomes more desperate to control and prevent nations from uh, from deserting the empire and joining the Belt and Road. And as that happens, that weakens also the empire's ability to keep the financial system from blowing up. So as they lose power, they also lose power over control of the financial system. So at some point here, I, be I believe it is relatively inevitable that at some point between the between the, the these nations breaking with the system and working with China and Russia and going for development, that at some point the ability to keep these financial instruments um, uh, uh, from blowing out will become less. Now the Chinese don't want a, a chaos, so they have, they have been plowing their uh, dollars back into the real economy, but. The situation is really ugly because you have the offshore, the city of London and the offshore system, the, the city of London corporation and the offshore system is, is unsustainable. At some point, this thing has to give. Unless you can convert all of that work, all of those offshore tax savings back into the grid, back into infrastructure and what have you, which, you know, it's possible that you could do that, that you could uh, repatriate all these funds into, uh, into productive investment, and I, I think that's a possibility. That might be the, the least destructive uh, way to go, but you can't count on that. So this is where our campaign in the U.S. is, is, is somewhat significant, and we have... Um, redone a 2018 uh, pamphlet called The Russia's Four Laws for Economic Recovery, A New Paradigm for Mankind. And this is what we're using to shape the politics in the U.S. And um, this pamphlet starts off by going into a speech of, not, doesn't, it doesn't give you the speech, but it talks about the speech that LaRouche gave on his 90th birthday in September of 2012, where he, where he laid out the, the coming collapse of the party system. And that is what got Trump elected. And then, um, the, uh, and then the coup against Trump is, occur, is occurring. Now, the coup against Trump is not about whether you like Trump or not, it's about whether the elected representative of the population of the United States who elected this man to change the economic situation and end the wars, <laughs> whether they have a right to just make a decision, or whether uh, other institutions, financial institutions and other institutions within the, within the government have uh, a veto power and have a right to override whatever uh, the people want, and, and that is really the issue in this coup. And if this coup is successful, then there's nothing to stop 
world wars, a world war, and, uh, and, and a total collapse of humanity, a, a total collapse of, of civilization. And um, the coup is going on simultaneously to trying to recruit Trump into all these wars. So the whole thing is being run in, in that way. So, so one of the pledges that people that were asking the, the candidates who are running is that, that they must pledge to end the coup against Trump. It doesn't matter what party they belong to or even whether they like Trump or whether they agree with Trump. And the second pledge is that America must join the Belt and Road. That is, America must work with China to expand itself to develop the world. And the third pledge is the economic reforms of the economic changes of, of, of the uh, four laws for economic recovery. So and, and so we're doing this, the same thing with our, our four, four steps for Canada's economic uh, recovery. So that uh, is basically uh, what the situation is. So we are, we are at the end of this empire. We have a situation where Germany may break with the system and begin collaborating with Russia and China in, the, in global development. And that would be a big one. And then you have France. And the French, our president is, is playing both sides, so far as I can tell. He's keeping one foot in with the war and, uh, and the empire, and he's, and he's also put another foot in in, in, in the other direction. Uh, I, don't, I think it's, yeah, it's very duplicitous on his part, but that's what he's doing. But if Germany goes that way, then will France go against Germany, or will France work with Germany in that respect? And then Italy, you already have a, 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 an emerging uh, ruling a government that is, that is very sympathetic to what we're doing. Although there's a lot of problems in Italy, as, as we all know. And the, 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 back, and the, and the uh, collaboration is now be, beginning with, between China and India in building the rail system uh, from China to Kyrgyzstan to Tajikistan to Afghanistan to Iran is very significant. And Mo, Modi is meeting with Putin. So you're getting all these meetings. You get Modi with Putin, Modi with Xi, Putin and, and Xi. All these, uh, all these discussions are going on. And they're not involving the U.S. directly. So what does this mean? This means that the U.S. is not dictating the policies anymore in the world. But the question becomes, how do you bring the U.S. in? So you don't end up, you know, destroying humanity. So uh, I'm going to stop there and open it up for questions and discussion. Give you some idea of, of the situation. I'm thinking back, but uh, that crack going through uh, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Afghanistan, not Turkmenistan. Huh? Going from China through the through yeah. uh, uh, Tajik Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, and uh, Afghanistan to Iran. That would. Uh, wouldn't it be easier to go through Turkmenistan? Turkmenistan? Yeah, Turkmenistan too. Okay. Yeah. Afghanistan is pretty, pretty shaky right now. Right. Other things, what it happens to the China Pakistan uh, To the what? Corridor? What is going to happen to the China Pakistan Development Corridor where they put all that money into that port? Well, I, I think, I, think I don't know, but I think it's proceeding, and I, and I think India is, is getting. Uh, is getting something in return. I'm not sure. I haven't. Yeah. I haven't followed it. But, but, um, but our correspondent in in, in India, Tanu Maitra, um, is telling us that Modi, Modi is not is not got elected on a, on economic uh, on an economic uh, promise. Uh, not and now he's he's got to deliver and he's. He may be out in the near future. No? Nope. It's such a complex situation. Yeah, it's a complex. Nobody knows any one thing correct. 
Okay, I, 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 I believe that. I, I can tell you his party just last week won a lot of seats where they're not supposed to win in a state election. Okay. So the truth is in between. The truth is in between, okay. <laughs> so we yeah, okay. always do not have full information. Right, we I, have agree. To go with I agree, basis. I agree. It just happened last week. Yeah. And like just the media guys here, all the media guys and the, and the sources they have, they have an agenda. No matter which party, which affiliation, which political leanings, they all have an agenda. Right, they all have an agenda. But so we they don't give you what's truth on the ground. Right. So we're, we, want, we want to get shovels in the ground in the U.S. especially at this point because and Canada too, but we want to get something going in the U.S. because the population isn't going to be forever, of the U.S. is going to be forever tolerating uh, the situation. Go ahead. Can, can you go through the, the history a bit? Um, like I know um, they, LaRouche and Haug got proposed the, um, the Independent Development Bay in 1997? Uh, 75. 75 and then and then the world land bridge when was that conceived that was in the early 90s but it came out of it came out of the european triangle what do you mean it came out of that okay um okay when it looked like the wall was going to come down it looked like the, the, the whole thing larouche played a, a mediating role with poland and his proposal was to take the industrial heartland of Europe and unleash it in developing Eastern Europe and East. And then a few years after that, it became the Belt and Road. Oh, okay. Okay, so it started before the wall came down. The world leveraging. Yeah, it started before the wall came down. And then uh, the, head, the head of the Deutsche Bank at that time was, had, had the same policy. And he was assassinated. And they, and they didn't do it. Instead of that, you had the, uh, the wild 90s in Russia and the looting, the massive looting of Russia. Instead of uh, taking advantage of the, the transition out of, that, out of their early system into, into a different system, they, they, they looted Russia. Like, I mean, and there was no development in Russia. They just plundered. It was the, probably the biggest plundering that, it, that has ever been done and that, until Putin came in, there was nothing to stop it. And finally, the process began. But it's still a problem. So, but LaRouche had proposed these things, and the problem was LaRouche went to jail at that crucial moment. He went to jail in January of 1989. And just before he went to jail, he gave a, a presentation in Germany, and we, we worked with a bunch of of uh, uh, people in the solidarity movement in Poland laying out this development plan as part of the whole transition uh, for, for this whole period. And, and, and the Bush administration, we're talking about the Bush administration, uh, Bush Sr., uh, went with the, with the looting. And then Clinton, uh, uh, saw this as leading to uh, problems, so he started to, to try to look for an alternative to that. And LaRouche was let out of prison, and uh, uh, Clinton helped LaRouche get out of prison, and then LaRouche went to Russia in 1994. Now, but the original plan for the Middle East uh, emerged in 1975. And in 1975, LaRouche put forward the Oasis plan. And the main, the main thing that he said is that the you cannot bring these people together through a political solution without first establishing economic, uh, the economic relationships that give them a reason for, for having a political solution. That's what its main, main idea, idea was. And he discussed this with a number of key Israelis, and they said, well, you know, we agree with you, but uh, you can't discount the factor of insanity in politics. And then he, he talked to the, to the uh, Iraqi people, and they agreed with him. He talked with the Egyptians, and they agreed with him. He talked to the Italians and the Germans, and they agreed with him. 
He was about to meet with the president of France on this. He was staying in the Somali embassy. And Kissinger personally called Giscard to stand the president of France in 1976 to force the cancellation of the meeting. The British were, were apoplectic. The Swiss were opposed to it. And the lineup in Europe. And then what happened is, is that um, LaRouche had to go underground because we had done a massive uh, mobilization against Brzezinski and the incoming car administration and their nuclear war games. And also, um, so LaRouche was on a terrorist hit list of the biden Weinhoff, and he went underground. Brzezinski had, was trying to have him assassinated, uh, but the people that were pursuing the same policies as LaRouche, they were uh, Hans Martin Schleier of Germany, Jurgen Ponto, they were they were assassinated, uh, and then when Ronald Reagan came in, Bush came in and, and began advising Ronald Reagan. But all of this was set in motion, and then what happened is when Clinton came in, uh, the Oslo Accords were established, which were based upon this Oasis Plan. The economic protocols for development were worked out at the Oslo Accords, but the International Monetary Fund intervened to wreck them. Nonetheless, there was this process going on, and then, and then the, the leader of Israel that was leading that process was assassinated, ultimately leading to Netanyahu taking power. This was uh, Rabin? Rabin, yeah. <laughs> and then, and then it, uh, who's the head of Deutsche Bank that got assassinated? It was uh, 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 Alfred Herrhausen. Herrhausen? Yeah. Oh, is there a Herrhausen? Herrhausen, yeah. Herrhausen. Yeah. yeah. He was assassinated. So that's the precursor to the history of this whole thing. So we've been at, at it for a long time. And now uh, there's a huge fight in, uh, in, uh, in, in the Congo. The, the enemy operations around the British and the, and the oligarchs of Europe are trying to prevent co the Congo from working with um, uh, the uh, Transaco program. So there's a huge fight going on now in, in, in Africa around whether or not they, will, they, they can get uh, so support from all the countries for Transaco, which would be the best thing for those countries. But, but you have oligarchical interests in that, in that region. Um, so so that, that, this all has precedence going back to 75. 75 is the beginning year, beginning year of the whole thing, of the whole process. And uh, how does it feel to have Chinese government adopting your movements? Um, OK. We, we have this very strange situation because the Chinese leadership is having a hard time explaining this to their population as well as to the population of Chinese outside of China. And yet they see us as the people who have, can explain it better than they can, and also not in Chinese. So what's, happened, what's happening is there's a, there's a lot of interplay between us and the, and, 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 and the Chinese, ethnic Chinese communities along the West Coast. And um, this is what, um, what we are um, all about. And our pamphlet will go a long ways in that direction. Um, and also our involvement in the conference will probably have significant Chinese participation. So, um, so that's also important. Mm -hmm. I should just remind everybody that our conference is still confirmed for um, July 24th at the Vancouver Public Library. I'll write all these details down, but go ahead and ask questions. Okay, anybody else have a question? If Trump is so serious about development of Americans, why does he worry about uh, saving jobs for Chinese in China? Come again? 
he just recently talked about saving jobs for Chinese losing jobs because of that ZTE. He he won election change blame Chinese taking American jobs. No. Yes. No, he no. did. He complained a lot about that. Um, okay. no, you could, if you look at it, he said it like a billion times. No, he, he did. But I can say it. 100%. I mean, like, you see, he's playing very, very plain simple. There, there, is okay. no jobs. there are nuances to this. Okay. The perception in the population is that China ripped the United States off. That's the perception of the population. He what, played on that. Huh? He played on that. Yes. Now let me explain it. But there are nuances to this. Okay. He said, also said on top of that, is that we don't blame China for doing that. We blame our own leaders for the economic policies that they have followed. So this is, this is the nuances. Okay. There's nuances here. Okay. In various campaign statements, he announced that he was he was for Glass Steagall and for the American system of Alexander Hamilton. Right? So he has indicated at, under no under uh, and then in one of these major rallies that he went to after he was president, he said, We're gonna rebuild America and we're gonna have foreign investment rebuild America. Well, what kind of foreign investment was he talking about? He was talking about Chinese investment. So all of this is in flux. Okay? The problem with Trump and the problem in general is Wall Street, the city of London, and the lack of understanding of what I'm talking about in the among the uh, among any of the people that are the professional class of people or economists and what have you who would, who would be who would have to implement any of this. They don't get it. It is really a problem. So Trump's Trump's open and the, what's happening what's happening right now is that the the the, the, edu, the education of his of his cabinet is being conducted by the Chinese. <laughs> the Chinese are doing the educating right now. We are doing all the this is a funny thing. We are doing the educating at the base, but the Chinese are doing the educating at of the, of the. The Chinese have to sit down with, with with his cabinet, his economic grouping, and say to them, "This is not going to work. This is not going to work. This is why it won't work. If you we have a trade war, you're going to get, you're going to, your country's going to be destroyed, you know, and on and on and on." So he, so right now you have a dialogue going on between the Chinese and the uh, U.S., but it's not about, it's not about, it's about, it's about a more profound distinction of ideas, and, and, and this is, this is what's going on. So, we don't have a direct access to his cabinet, <laughs> but, hold on, but the Chinese have, and they are definitely, if, they are definitely trying to educate these people. Whether they will succeed or not remains to be seen, but we have to do our, our job. The same question. As an elected head of the government, you should worry about his own people's jobs, not somebody else's jobs. Especially with the ones that he claimed and everybody else claimed that they stole our jobs. Can I, can I just, hang on, talk. Also, one more thing, just one minute. Talk. We talked about this cabinet being educated, right? He doesn't have a cabinet, it's like the average Life of every any cabinet secretary is less than six months. So well, where does he have a, a cabinet? I'm talking about the economic group. And it's he doesn't have any operating cabinet. Um. You need to have stable <laughs> leadership, <laughs> stable cabinet to do anything substantial. Everybody is going okay. wrong. No, the it, so. Okay, it doesn't matter. Okay, it doesn't matter whether it. You know, it's a very complicated situation. He wants to work with China, but he, but at the same, you know, it's a very complicated situation. Paul, Paul, can yeah. I just, there, there's there's something that um, you know, as I'm going through our pamphlet, right? 
And to address your somewhat facetious question, because it's... Oh, sorry, sorry, what was that? It's, it's facetious in, in, in a way because... No, it's not. Well, I, I, I agree, disagree. I mean, okay. you know, we well, have to debate. Okay, that's fine. So I'm going to debate you, okay? That's fair. Okay. As I've been going through the history, in, in our booklet, not in the American one, in our Canadian booklet, we have a history of the financial situation from 1945 uh, on, pretty much. I mean, over the last 100 years. Um, I've worked in the financial industry. I used to be the executive assistant for uh, the vice president of uh, mid-size financial corporation. They sold securities, trust, insurance, and um, and commercial, but you know mostly just like rich people's savings accounts. Um, you had to have a minimum of five hundred thousand dollars to become a client of this company. I made twenty four thousand dollars a year. Crap, right? Um, I saw the culture that has been perpetuated and fostered by successive governments. This is a cultural problem. If we're going to pin the tail on any one individual, you are missing the point. We have a cultural, well, no. No, no, but let me, let me, and this is not just addressed to you, but this is addressed to, to like, the population in general, because I see this all the time. I see it online, I see it in person, I see it in, in you know, uh, just debating in general. It's, it's very um, uh, easy and convenient to look at the, the person in charge. Now, there's a couple things about the person in charge right now, okay? He is supposed to be the final say of the country. It's clear that he's not. He has counter, he, was, he has contradicted most of the people that he's put in place. Now, if you consider the fact that this culture, this apparatus, this financial system has been fomented for decades, you have to imagine that your pool of recruits is going to be very, you're going to be very limited in finding people who have this kind of uh, <coughs> uh, outlook. Right? I, I, was, I was asked by a mayor here in the U.S., you know, I was explaining to him what uh, Bill C-15, which is essentially the bailing, right? And as you explain to these government officials that the government wrote a bill that allows the banks to convert your savings into worthless bank stock, okay? I explained it to them like that. And he looked at me and he just said, why would the government do this? Why would the government do this? And I said, well, I think you're missing the point. Um, why would they have to do this to cover up for the gross incompetency and greed and sheer criminality of our financial system? There's a difference between uh, something that's technically legal and what is moral. And sometimes morality falls into the illegal category. And sometimes immorality falls into the legal category. And we're in a topsy-turvy world right now, period. So the system is broken. And if we're looking at Trump as, you know, some, uh, you know, cap capable of rising above that and just signing crap away, or turning it all over yeah, overnight. Well, let me, 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 I he came say that I'm going to correct all these things. Yeah, he has done the opposite so far. Well, okay, that's a very broad statement. He made statement. those promises. But that's a very broad statement. Yes, of course he did. That's and how he's going to say I'm swamped that he yeah, delivered it from the being, financial you're, system. You're being very literal. Uh, that's how the campaigning works. Look at the facts on, on the ground. That's it's, it's, well, it's I'm, not, I'm not disagreeing. Yeah, they can't stretch the Wall Street. Can you understand that? He's a symptom of a broken system. He's not in charge. He promised all 